Okay, good morning. All right, so we're done with series, so that's kind of sad, but we'll do something else for a while. Let's, do, uh, let's look at chapter 10. Now, the few things we're going to be going over for the rest of the semester are kind of setting up for what you will see in Calc 3. If you do move on to that class, if you have to take that class and you take it next semester, you'll see many of the things that we're doing for the next few days coming back. We'll start with looking at curves defined by what's called parametric equations. When you take Calc 3, there's going to be a big chunk of the course on parametric equations and the calculus behind it. So you need to see a little bit of the basics before you get there. Let's look at a very simple equation, y is equal to x squared. And we'll restrict it to just the positive values of x, including 0. And we know what this looks like. It's the right half of a parabola opening upward. Okay, so that's a very simple thing here, simple equation, simple shape. And in this kind of equation, we have y defined as a function of x. Or we could have x defined as a function of y, right? In any case, we have x and y related directly. This kind of equation is called a Cartesian equation. When we relate x and y and in 3D, z directly. Okay, now suppose that x and y here also depend on a third variable. And we'll use t. Because in many applications, T stands for time. It doesn't have to be time, but thinking, that, thinking of it in terms of time helps seeing what's going on here, and that's what happens with a lot of applications. So this means that X is equal to some function of time, F of T, and Y is some function of time, G of T. For example, what we could do here is to say x is equal to t and y is equal to t squared, right? So I simply change x to t, so now x depends on t. It's the same thing, but it doesn't matter. And then y also depends on t. So we don't have the relationship between x and y explicitly written out, but we wrote out what they do when t is involved. We want x to be just positive and 0, so we also have to do the same thing with t here, because x and t are the same thing. Right? So what I got here is equivalent to that equation. And this kind of thing is called a parametric equation. And T here is what's called a parameter. Once again, in applications, it's often time, but it doesn't have to be time. <coughs> At its very ba basic level, it's just another variable that could be any number.
So let's sketch this out. We know it's going to look like that, but a couple of different features will show up in this when we sketch this out. So we got x is equal to t, y is t squared, and t is positive or zero. So now pretend we don't know what the graph looks like. You're presented with these three things, and you want to get a shape. So what we do, we do what we almost always do, right? We pick a few values of t here. We find out what x and y are. Then we connect the dots. So this is pretty simple. Let's do 0, 1, 2, 3. I think that's good enough there. When t is 0, x is 0, of course. So is y, right? When t is 1, x is 1 y is 1, t is 2, x is 2, y is 4, and 3, and 9. <coughs> then you look at the second and third column for x and y. These are the dots you put down here. Let's use a different color. That. So that's my first dot, second dot, two and four up here, three and nine way up here. So something like that. Furthermore, because we look at T specifically, and T controls both of these things, we also have a very clear sense of direction. When t is 0, they start here, and then they keep moving to the right that way. So we get a very, very good indication of what the evolution of that graph is. We know it starts at the origin, and it continues going upward following the parabola. All right, let's do another example. Let's try y, x is equal to 1 minus t squared. y is t plus 2. And we will restrict t to be between minus 2 and 2. So here, t is harder to, to see as time, right? Negative time, don't know what that means. But still, it's a variable that both of them depend on. We just follow the same procedures we did. You choose a bunch of values of t between the ranges, find out x and y, connect the dots, and there's your graph. Let's do minus 2, minus 1, 1, oop, no, 0, 1, 2. Sure. And then let's see, x is 1 minus t squared, so minus 3 and 0. 0, 1, 1, 2, 0, 3. And then minus 3 and 4. <coughs> okay. All right, let's put the dots on there. Minus 3, 0 right here. 
zero one one two zero three minus three four. There we go. Here we got a sideways parabola, and we again, we also know the direction. We know we started here, we ended here. So that's the direction that we traveled in. All right, so you see the one advantage of using parameter here is Noticing this shape here, this, this shape fails the vertical line test. It's not a function. So we really can't write as y as some function of x because this is not a function. For this to be a function, for each value of x I choose, I can only get at most one value of y, but I don't have that. I have more than I need. So this is not a function. That means we couldn't write this y as a function of x. But notice when we do the parametric way, it really doesn't matter how x and y are directly related. As long as we know how they relate to t, we can always get a graph back without having to worry about it the complications of that not being a function. Still, let's try turning this back into the Cartesian form. X is equal to 1 minus t squared. Y is t plus 2. And there are many ways to do this. The, the easiest way to do this is to solve for the variable t. from one equation. And choose the one that's easier to work with. We can work with this equation, but we gotta worry about the square root. Let's do the second equation first. So we see that t is y minus two. Then you take that t and substitute that into the other equation you didn't work with. It's just like solving simultaneous equations. Now we see x is equal to one minus t squared, right? That's also equal to that or that. All right, so all th the top or the bottom one are both fine. In any case, you see here that we couldn't write y as a function of x without worrying about radical and plus and minus, all that stuff. But x as a function of y is okay. All right, so that's the idea behind the parametric equations. You relay your variables to some common variable. <coughs> when you take calc three, you'll be dealing mostly in three or higher dimensions. So you have x, y, maybe z, also depend on t. But the same basic idea comes back when you deal with higher dimensions.
Okay, let's check out this set of equations. X is cosine of T, Y is sine of T, and we let T go between 0 and 2 pi. All right, so can you recognize this shape without doing any point plotting thing? What shape is this? The fact that we're dealing with pies here should be a pretty, pretty big clue. Circle, yeah. So if you didn't see the circle part, check this. Here's one way to see it. We know that cosine squared of anything plus sine squared of anything else is equal to 1, right? So this tells me that x squared plus y squared, because that's x and y, is equal to 1. And this we know is a circle with the origin at the, with the center at the origin and the radius of 1. But you could, of course, always plot the points the way we did earlier and then connect the dots. All right, so here's my circle. Radius of 1. And that's a good circle. I have to brag about it. Okay, where do we start? Where's the starting point? We're dealing with parametric equation now, so we've got to talk about the starting location. Where's the starting location? T is 0, so cosine of 0 is 1. 1. And sine of 0 is 0. So where am I? Here? Right? So here's where we start. Okay, now we know we go around the circle. Which direction are we traveling in? Counterclockwise, and how do we know that? Right. So if you didn't have trouble seeing that, again, go back to the points here. Let's do pi over 2. Those are good values to use. <coughs> when t is pi over 2, cosine is 0, right? When, and sine is 1. So we're here when t is pi over 2. Let's go one more. Cosine of pi is minus 1. Sine of pi is 0. So a little bit later, we end up here. And we do this up to 2 pi. That brings us back to here. So we know where we start. And we also know how we are going around the circle. All right. OK, so that's not bad. This is going counterclockwise. Now, what if we want the same circle? Same starting and ending locations. But I wanted to go clockwise. So 
the same shape. I still want to start here. I still want to end here. But I don't want to go that way. I want to go this way. What do you think? Multiply by, so change t to minus t, okay? And why would that work? That's right, yeah. So one way to think about this is how, how we got these points. Notice we let t be 0, pi over 2, and pi. So what we did is essentially treating t like that, right? t and theta, the theta value we normally use with the trig functions, are indistinguishable here. T is going counterclockwise. That's the direction of increasing theta. So note T equal to theta. In the increasing theta direction. So that's how I got my counterclockwise rotation in the first place, because t increasing t is the same as the regular increasing theta. So if I want clockwise, change t to minus t. That's going to give me the same shape. and I'll keep the same range of my parameter. I simply change all the t in the parametric equations for x and y to negative t. And I keep the same range. So it's the same angle that we counted backwards. Notice that we know cosines and even function. So changing t to minus t doesn't change cosine. And you can also see that because if I measure t the other way, cosine is still going to do the same thing. Starts out positive, gets smaller, right? And go into negative. But y is going to change sign. Y starts positive right now, but when we go clockwise, y is going to start negative. And that you will see also here because sine is an odd function. When you change the parameter to negative, it's the same as using the same equation, but put a minus sign in front of it. All right, so this will give me my um, counter, uh, clockwise circle starting at 0, 1. and ending back there again. Okay? What if I want a clockwise circle starting at 1, 0, but I want three complete revolutions? Do these two equations change? No, they define the shape, so they don't change. I still get the same equations.
okay? So this defines shape. It's the t, the parameter, that defines how far we go and which direction we go. X and Y is simply a shape problem. All right, so I want three complete revolutions. So what do I want t to go from? Zero, yeah. Zero puts me here, and I want three revolutions. So three times of that, six pi. Okay, that's pretty easy. All right, let's make another change. I want counterclockwise one revolution starting at minus one, zero. And I want counterclockwise, so that way. Many different ways to do this. So uh, let me give you one minute to come up with one way to get this. Just give me one way to do it. One minute. All right, so someone give me one set of parametric equations for this thing here. Negative cosine t, okay? Y is sine t, okay? And? zero to two pi. What do you think? And what does T do then? Mm -hmm. Pi and three pi. Okay, any other idea? Okay. And what do you want T to do? Good. Other ideas?
Yeah, I could do that too, right? Yeah, yeah. There are many, many different ways to get that, right? There are many different ways to accomplish the same goal. So we have at least three ways here. Okay, let's look at these three in a little bit here. Um, what do you think of the first one? First of all, is it right? What do we think? If I use t, if I let t be pi over 4, I should be here, right? So does it put me in the right place? What's wrong with it? If t is pi over 4, I should be here. Negative cosine of pi over 4 is right here, so that's good. Sine of pi over 4 is Positive or negative? Positive, but I want it to be here. So what's wrong with this? At least the sign here is not quite right, right? So I really need a minus here to make it work. But the idea is very good. Now check out these three equations. They are really all the same thing, aren't they? Because cosine of t plus pi, this just turns cosine into minus cosine. Sine of t plus pi just turns sine into minus sine. If you go half a cycle ahead, cosine turns into negative a cosine. Sine turns into negative a sine. So these are really the same thing. So is that. This is just counting t from an, a later point. But we could always say we want to count 0 and add pi to every t. So they're the same equation, the same um, different expressions, but the same set of description here. All right, so that's the, uh, the, the basic thing behind um, parametric equations. You normally, normally, Since t is usually time, in many applications, we usually like t to start at 0. Start. But that's not a requirement. You, there's nothing wrong with starting t at pi or 3 pi, or 5 pi, or 7 pi, or 103 pi. It's fine. But in most applications, T stands for time. And often, for obvious reasons, we want T to start at 0. And increasing, right? We usually don't want time to decrease. Now, if you want the same thing we just did, but for a circle with a different radius and a different center, so now we, we don't restrict ourselves to 0, 0, and 1 for radius. So I want to go anywhere, say h, k, and whatever r you want it to be. So if you want to start here, normally that would be the, the uh, zero, the one zero location, but where we normally start with a circle, and go one revolution. So you take the same equations we started earlier, cosine and sine. If you want the radius to be something other than one, you simply put the r in front of each of them. So this will allow you to have a different radius. 
And then to shift the center, we want to shift, shift x by h amount. So you simply take this x and you get, add h to it. And then we shift y by k amount. So we take that y and add k to it. And here, we'll restrict t to go from 0 to 2 pi. And everything we just did with the flipping the direction, changing where we start, everything's the same. Except you work with these equations. You change t, you'll go the other way. If you want to go to start a different place, you can change where you start, or you can modify the form <coughs> of t. So this will allow you to get any circle with a different center, different radius. Questions? that would give you an ellipse rather than a circle. So in this case, you're talking about the, the, the major and minor axes of a circle rather than the radius uh, of an ellipse rather than the radius of a circle. So different r, what he's talking about is what if we have different values of r in front of cosine and sine? Say that's one, that's three. You end up getting an ellipse rather than a circle. So we consider circle as an ellipse, but it has the one with the same major and minor axes. Just like a, a square is a rectangle, right? It's a special rectangle. Here's one common application of parametric equations. Um, we'll look at projectile motion without air resistance. At least negligible air resistance. So think about when you when you throw a ball, hit, the, hit a golf ball, or, or things like that. We know what the uh, motion of that thing is going to be. Right, it's going to follow a parabola. And it's going to be just a basic parabola, symmetric, because we're not, like, not accounting for air resistance. If you have air resistance, then this will not be a symmetric parabola. It'll be a little bit squished, but the basic idea is the same. And we'll assume that the angle that you launch it with, we'll call that alpha. And we'll call the velocity that you launch this thing with v sub zero. And now here are the equations that will describe the motion. X is v sub zero times cosine alpha of t. And y is the same thing with a sine instead times t minus 1 half g t squared. So you get, this, you get this set of equations by applying Newton's law, Newton's second law. And then you integrate from 
acceleration back to the um, position. <coughs> and G here, of course, is gravity. 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so this equation, this set of equations describe the, uh, the motion of the object. And in this context here, T is time, right? T is time. And we know the way we count time, we start at zero, we end at whatever. All right? So let's put a few numbers in here. Let's say we're launching this thing with a 30 degree angle. With an initial velocity of 900 meters per second. And the first problem I'd like to solve then is When will the object hit the ground? So here is another advantage of parametric equations. When we're talking about hit the ground, we're talking about the altitude. So that means I only need to worry about the y part of the equation. Whatever x is doing, I don't really care where it lands. I just want to know when it hits the ground. So we just look at y. Ignore x, right? This is one thing that parametric equations allow you to do. And also, if you've taken physics, you know that in the absence of air resistance, in this situation here, the horizontal and vertical positions of the object are independent of each other, right? But in any case, because I only need to know what's going on with the altitude, I only have to look at the y equation. So here's the y equation with the numbers thrown in. 900 meters per second, Sine of 30 degrees is one, of one half T minus one half G T squared. And I make that equal to zero because I want this thing to hit the ground. And we're counting y, the altitude from ground up. Then we solve that equation for t. Take out a T. So we see that T is equal to zero. That's when we start. So that makes sense. We should find T two, lo two time, right? When we start and when we end. The second time must be when we impact the ground. So that would be from here. T is equal to uh, 900 over 9.8, <coughs> which is roughly 92 seconds. Okay, so this thing travels in air for 92 seconds, and at the end of that 
motion, it hits the ground. Now suppose I got this answer, I say, I want to know how far it traveled. That's the second question then. Where did it hit the ground? So now I'm interested in how far did I travel with respect to the ground. So how would you find this? Yeah, so now I'm only interested in the horizontal, right? So I go to my x equation. And I know when I hit the ground now, I know it's at 92 seconds. So I put 92 in there. So that's approximately 71,580 meters. This must have been a rocket or something. One last question. Maximum height. What do you think? So here's t equal to zero. Here's t is equal to 92. Can you find out when the maximum height occurs? Yeah halfway in the middle. So right here, this is 92 over 2, whatever that is. Halfway down, halfway in the middle. This is only true when air is not changing the motion. Half between 0 and 92. True only if no air resistance. If air is accounted for, then we can't just take halfway in between the two. Because then we cannot assume that this thing will have a perfect uh, uh, parabolic shape, right? But in this simple problem, we can do that. So once again, I want to know altitude. So I go back to y equation again. And I plug in this value for t. So, skip a little algebra here. Um, it's roughly that, 10,332 meters. Right, so now you've seen one of the major advantages of parametric equations, we, instead of dealing with one potentially complicated equations, we deal with multiple simpler equations. And often, like in this case, we only want to know one of those variables rather than the whole thing. Okay, that's it for today. See you Wednesday.